Oki, nistu ni dani go sabinaki. Those words I spoke to you are in Blackfoot, and they translate to greetings. My name is Slanted Eye Woman, and I'm from the Gaina Nation. I am a researcher and an assistant professor in Indigenous Studies at Mount Royal University here in Calgary, Alberta. And I would like to share my identity with you because my identity is central to the story that I'm about to share with you. And my identity also shapes the stories that people tell about myself and about my, and about my, um, my nation. So pictured here is uh, an image of uh, my landscape in the Blackfoot territories in southern Alberta. I connect my genealogy to the sacred Rocky Mountains, pic represented here through Nanastigo Chief Mountain. I connect my genealogy to the sacred lands and the sacred rivers of the Blackfoot Confederacy. It is these lands that have shaped Sixagate to be the Blackfoot speaking people of southwestern Canada and northwestern United States. Part of my identity as well is shaped by my ancestors. My ancestors include my grandparents and my great grandparents, as well as my parents. My parents are pictured here Peter and Wanda Weaselhead or Eagle Ribs and American Horsewoman. The picture in the far uh, bottom right, uh, the little girls there, that's my mom and my auntie just before they were taken to the Indian residential schools. My mom is still with us. My auntie has passed on. So it's very important for me to position myself in this way because for years I've had my identity as an Indigenous woman defined for me. My histories have been relegated to myth. My ways of knowing, my knowledges have been seen as primitive. My spirituality has been looked upon as superstition. And my technologies have been categorized as Stone Age. Today, the stories of my people are sometimes only legends. So I want to st share a story with you about my own personal transformation. And like stories, I think they take a life of their own. So 24 hours ago, I had every intention of sharing with you my research around Blackfoot resilience. But as I pulled up to this venue, um, this old building, uh, and walked through these doors, I knew that I had to tell another story because it is this place that is central to my transformation and my healing journey. Because 27 years ago, my, my oldest daughter was almost abducted just in front of this building. I'm going to take you back to 27 years ago. So I lived just up the street from here, like literally half a block, like I could see the school. My oldest daughter, Maria, was a student here in um, grade one. And I take her to school every day and, and pick her up for lunch. That one day, uh, she was to go home uh, with her friends. Oh, well, come back to my place, and I was to make lunch for them. And so um, that was what we agreed upon. And I told Maria, OK, you're going to walk back with your friends. And, and uh, one of her friends was in grade six, so I was feeling pretty good about it. I thought, well, that's fine. And so anyways, I heard the lunch bell ring. I was getting things ready. and then. I stood on my balcony and I looked and I could see Maria coming out of the school with her friends, but there was lots of traffic and then a big bus pulled up and, and kind of obscured my view. And so I couldn't see Maria and her friends anymore. And then the bus, it eventually uh, drove away and I saw Maria's friends running the other way. And I thought, well, where's Maria? I, a feeling of dread just immediately came over me. 
And I put my shoes on and I walked out and, and I walked down the street and sure enough, Maria came running along with her friends. They were just kind of center, centered all around her. And so they came up to me and they told me, Maria almost got stolen, Maria almost got stolen. I was confused, I was terrified, I was relieved beyond belief. So I found out later, as I was talking with Maria that evening, she was really shook up. And when I saw her just, you know, pale as a sheet, as if she had seen a monster, I told her, Maria, what happened? Can you share with me what happened? She said, I was walking with my friends and a man all of a sudden came in front of me and he was wearing a Freddy Krueger mask and he lifted up his fist as if he was going to hit me and I ran and I ran and I ran until my, I could hear my friends calling me and I turned around and he was gone. Three years later, I was sitting with Maria and she was feeling very reflective. She was really quiet and she told me, Mom, do you think God forgot about me that day? Is that why I was almost stolen? I told her, no, Maria. God didn't forget about you. I think he gave you superhuman powers and superhuman strength, and you were super fast, and you ran. And you are, here you are today. So that was my little girl's experience. I grew up on the largest <clears throat> reserve in Canada the Blood Tribe, the Blood Tribe Reserve, which is located in southern Alberta. So as a little girl, I always wondered, why am I on a reserve? Like, don't they put wild animals on reserves too? Wild and dangerous animals. So I, I was taught through the education system that essentially we were considered, indigenous people were considered part of the local wildlife. I was taught that we stood in the way of progress. I was taught that pioneers came to our lands and, and taught us a better way of living. I was basically taught that we needed to be saved from ourselves. And I also learned in my experiences in Canadian society that perhaps I didn't matter as much as other Canadians. And I firmly believe that what happened to my daughter that day, that that man who tried to take her, that he didn't think that my daughter's life mattered either. So I stand before you today, 27 years later, in the same place where my daughter was almost abducted and stolen from me. But I'm not the same person that I was. 27 years ago. In fact, I'm not the same person that I was yesterday when I drove up here. This has been part of my healing journey in every sense of the word. And even though indigenous people today, we experience, uh, we are experiencing addictions. Yes, we are. We're experiencing racism. We're experiencing discrimination and poverty and all of that. But we're also embodying our resilience and we're also embodying our healing. And we're also walking in this world with a legion of ancestors behind us. So my work around Blackfoot resilience has taught me that we must experience our own suffering in order to be transformed by it. And to be transformed by our suffering makes us better able to recognize the stories of suffering of other people in really relational and compassionate ways. But for many, many years, I stood 
stood in the way of my own suffering uh, and, and stood in the way of learning from my suffering, I mean, and stood in the way of my own transformation because I was embodying the stereotypes that Canadian society was imposing on me. I was embodying those stereotypes and I was reproducing them even. So I ask you as, as you go through your day and, and you think about your own transformation and you think about your own assumptions that you make of other people and the own sort of these snap judgments we make of people we don't know, um, how, are, how are you standing even in the way of your own of your own transformation? Are you allowing yourself to be changed? You know, and so thank you for, for listening to me today and I'm very honored to stand in front of you and share that story of healing and resilience. Thank you.